Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Perez. Um, I'll be walking through today uh, taking uh, image stacks from electron microscopy um, to doing image segmentation to then analyzing the segmentations. Um, just a little bit of introduction uh, uh, on myself. I'm a postdoc uh, with MBCR and also um, with Mark Ellisman, as Robert uh, introduced, at, at NICMER, the National Center for Microscopy and Imaging Research, another P41 uh, research institute in the medical school here at UCSD. Um, and I'm putting on this class with Chris Churis, who is right here. He's one of the main developers on all the software I'll be introducing. Um, before I get started, and <laughs> this is going to be a significantly different response than uh, when I asked this last year, uh, raise your hand if you've worked with electron microscopy data before. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'm going to, so, so the, the reason it's, it's different is there's a lot of people from NICMER here, so uh, we're all intimately familiar with EM data and, and a lot of this process. So um, for those who aren't, uh, the first maybe hour of the lecture is going to focus on introducing you to what EM is, what the data is, how it's collected, and um, some of the tools we use. And then the first uh, demo session um, after our coffee break will be introducing you to the tool called iMod um, that's used for uh, manual annotation of the data. Then we'll show you um, uh, a workflow we've developed to automate the segmentation process uh, using a, a web portal developed by Chris and others. Uh, then uh, break for lunch, and then um, getting into what to do with those segmentations, how to take them to three-dimensional models, and uh, how to analyze them and get quantitative data out of them, which is the, the end goal of the whole process. So uh, just an overview of this first session. Uh, as I mentioned, first we'll introduce you to uh, what is microscopy. Uh, then a little bit of the scale of the challenge, uh, why we need these automated tools for image analysis, uh, introduce you to what those tools are, and then there'll be a live demo of the software that you'll be using in the ensuing um, uh, demo. So just to give sort of a, uh, a really easily accessible um, analogy to what we're doing here, uh, this, this, this was a hit last year, uh, is, is, is a, a head of cabbage. So if you picture on the left, you just have this head of cabbage. You don't know what the inside looks like. You don't know how the, the, the patterns are, are arranged. Um, one way of figuring out what those inside patterns are would be, like you see in this animation here, to just take sequential cuts through the cabbage, kind of collect them all individually, and then, as you see here, stack them up. That way we can see what's going on inside. And this. <laughs> This was actually a, a, a video that one of an undergraduate student who worked with me found and sent me. I was like, "Hey, this is this looks like what we're doing. Is this is this good?" I'm like, yes, <laughs> thank you. And I've used it for years since. So, um, uh, some problems that we could potentially run into during this process that are analogous to, to things we run into with microscopy. Um, you might have one of the slices that 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 kind of falls apart. Or, or it, it, analogously with imaging is out of focus. Uh, it, might get sh it might shrink, it might expand, it might just all blow up in your face. So you might be missing one little section where you don't have that, that information on how the inside is arranged. Uh, you might just be missing it altogether. And uh, they, once you've cut them, obviously, it's going to be a really hard process of figuring out how they um, overlap back on each other. So these, the reason I introduced this sort of dummy example is this, this is very analogous to what we get with three-dimensional electron microscopy. So, so what I'm going to show you here on this slide is uh, a, a method for creating three-dimensional volumes of data using electron microscopy that has been used throughout the years. Um, and first you start with a, a block of your tissue uh, embedded in a, a piece of plastic here. And traditionally, um, what would be done is you would take this block to an ultramicrotome, which is basically just a, a really a knife that is able to take cuts through the section through the um, surface of the block at controlled increments. 
to say every 50, 100 nanometers. Then these would be collected on a, a, a grid for electron microscopy that can hold maybe three to five of those sections. That would then be taken to a transmission electron microscope and imaged so that each of these sequentially 50 nanometer cut sections would be imaged once in that same area generating your image stack. So as you can see, this has the same type of problems that I introduced with the head of cabbage. You have to, first of all, it's very slow. So this, is all, this used to all be manual. So it would require a technician to perform the sectioning at the microtome, collect them onto grids, take them to the microscope, put the grids in the microscope, find the correct section, image it multiple times. And hopefully if you did all of this without any error, you'd have a continuous stack of images of your cell or of your organelle or whatever it was you were trying to image. Um, and, and, and believe it or not, this was done many times. This used to be the sort of go-to method for doing this, this sort of manual work. And some references here just to give you a, a scale of how difficult this is. Uh, this is this first uh, reference with the C. elegans connectome is, is sort of the uh, landmark paper in the field of connectomics the first time. So connectomics, for those who aren't uh, familiar, is the a uh, field of study in which people are trying to use large three-dimensional electron microscopy to map the wiring diagrams of neurons. So using these sort of three-dimensional EM imaging techniques combined with automated segmentation strategies that we'll be introducing, segmenting all of the cells contained within a block of tissue and then analyzing how they touch and how they interact with each other. This was one of the first studies to do that and it required 8,000 of these sections. So if you, if you picture someone sitting there and cutting that amount of sections on that many grids and imaging that many times in a microscope. It's extremely difficult and very error prone. So luckily, um, there have been a number of tools developed in the past decade that automate this process. The first, uh, um, and, and the one that we use most extensively, called uh, serial block-based scanning electron microscopy. So. It's, it's a very sort of, in, in retrospect, an intuitive uh, process. I'm going to try to play this video here. No. It worked this morning. <laughs> So what you see here is a, a scanning electron microscope with what's called a three view mounted on top of it. And the three view sort of automates that process of cutting and collecting the sections. So instead of needing to have a person sitting and manually cutting sections and collecting them onto grids, the, the ultra microtome is mounted inside the chamber. And when the specimen's inserted, the knife in an automated cycle just cuts one section off, and then the surface of that block is imaged using the SEM. Um, and then that's repeated cyclically over and over until you've collected, uh, as you see here through the depth of your tissue, enough um, images to sort of cover the, whatever it is you want to image, be, whether it's a cell or a, a certain organelle, um, whatever. So here you see that the, the um, Electron beam makes a raster scan across the surface of that block after it's cut. And um, the advantages of this are that it's, A, it's automated, it's a lot less error prone, and um, the images as they come off are um, already in pretty good alignment with one another because the block's just staying stationary. So instead of having to have a human go in and find your area on the microscope and hope it's, it's close enough where you'll have a lot of translation and overlapping sections here, they're, they're, they're pretty much stacked uh, uh, very reliably uh, in alignment with one another. So here you just see a rotation through that 3D volume. This is fairly small compared to what we're, we're dealing with. Any questions so far? It's a very basic introduction. Okay.
So just kind of, of recapping what I've uh, mentioned so far. Um, serial section transmission electron microscopy, the old way, the old, the manual way, very labor intensive. It, you'd ha it would be almost impossible to collect a large block of uh, a volume of uh, data without losing some sections or, or having some just manual issues with collecting the data. Um, serial block face SEM automates this whole process, gives us uh, data sets that are very well aligned, and it basically lets us collect almost as large of a data set as you can give a block of tissue. So you can just keep collecting, it can keep cutting and acquiring, cutting and acquiring, and um, at the end of the day you have your gigantic set of data. Uh, as you can imagine, this has uh, led to an exponential growth in our ability to acquire data. So uh, one of these data sets that we're used to dealing with is about anywhere from one to two, potentially more terabytes of, of image data. And that can be collected in a, in a few days now, uh, whereas that would have been previously a, a monumental task to acquire. We can now collect that in an automated manner really quickly. So a lot of the um, a lot of the challenge is now shifted away from that to how do what do we do with this once we've collected it? How do we analyze this data? How do we get any uh, biologically relevant quantitative data out of it? Um, so here is just an example of one data set that was acquired using this technique. This red box here shows the region of interest that was imaged. Uh, within the brain. This is a region of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's the, your master circadian pacemaker. Uh, this is a collaborative project that was really one of the drivers for the development of the technology we're discussing today. So what you see here in the red box is um, what's collected in this volume over here. So using our uh, camera and detector, we get data sets that are about 32,000 by 24,000 pixels in one slice. And then this data set in particular is 1,300 slices, but that can be bigger or smaller depending on really the interests of your project. Um, the other thing I should note is that we have high resolution. Uh, so this data set in the xy direction is about 4 nanometers per pixel with 30 nanometer increment steps. So it's, it's anisotropic. So here we're going to play through that stack, and there will be a higher resolution movie after this so you can really see what we're, we're talking about. But uh, we're going to zoom in here on just one of the cells. So each of these are individual cell nuclei. So you can see how expansive this is. It's covering hundreds of cells just in, within one field of view. And... Um, You have the, not only do you have the sort of breadth to pick up hundreds of cells at once, but you also have the resolution to identify all of the subcellular constituents within that cell. So, as I mentioned, pointed out nucleus, mitochondria, lysosomes, um, synaptic vesicles, endoplasmic reticulum are all things that we can identify in these data sets. So, using this technology, you can imagine any number of sort of experiments where you can have a, have a control and have some sort of experimental perturbation to that and study how things are structurally changing. Um, in the case of this study with the suprachiasmatic nucleus, we were looking at um, how structure changes at different times throughout the day because it's the um, master circadian pacemaker. Um, so this, te this technology really has enabled us to collect the data and, and, and really uh, um, propose experiments using uh, three-dimensional structural uh, parameters that would really never have been feasible before. So as promised, here's a, here's a higher resolution view. Again, each of these are individual cell nuclei. You saw a blood vessel passing through there. And this is just a rotation through the stack. This is the same stack I referred to before, 1,300 slices down with 30 nanometer cuts. These are individual neurons colorized here that were manually segmented using the software that we'll be introducing. Um, after this rotation, that orange one is going to become transparent. And you'll see it's filled with the organelles. 
so the yellow is the nucleus and all the green are individual mitochondria. Uh, those were all automatically generated using the tools that we'll discuss by the end of the day. So at the end of the day, the goal um, for everyone in this class would be to be able to load that EM data on your laptop, manually segment the data um, in a small amount, uh, use some tra what we'll call training data, which I'll introduce in, in the next few slides, to train a machine learning algorithm to detect those organelles, and then three-dimensionally render them, as you see here. So by the end of the day, you should all have something that, that looks like what you see inside of that cell and, and be able to be comfortable with that process of generating that. Um, so now a, a lot of you are probably wondering what I'm referring to by segmentation. Uh, I'm just going to introduce a very simple demonstration again to, to really introduce the concept. So here in the bottom left corner is a sphere and let's say we wanted to uh, in an analogous way to what we were doing with the serial block base, let's take some sections through that sphere, um, as we've done here. Let's say we wanted to, if we only had views of that sphere from the top down like we would with an electron microscope, if we trace the perimeter of each uh, cross-section through that sphere, like you see here, we can then build a three-dimensional mesh uh, using that, those um, traced contours to give us back an approximation of that starting sphere. So that's analogous to what we'll be doing uh, with EM data, except as has been the case so far, the actual uh, biological data is many times more complicated than that simple example. So. Um, here we see two slices. These are actually of the same mitochondrion here that we see um, filled in with pink or magenta. Uh, the reason, the, the, the point of this illustration is to show why we need three-dimensional data to, to really know what the structure of that mitochondrion is. So if we had just that top slice there, you wouldn't know that it, those two belong to the same structure. So if you just had that image with no three-dimensional context, you would naively just say that those are two different structures because they're, they're not touching each other. Similarly, down here, you'd say that was just one. However, if we fill in all of those intermediate slices and do that same thing of, of filling in the mitochondrion, you'll see that it evolves and branches into like a, a Y shape, as you see here. So without that three-dimensional context, you would have no idea that that was a, that it was one structure, and B, that it had this sort of morphology. Um, of course, as you can imagine, doing this sort of annotation where we, as I, uh, with the, using the software, I'll introduce iMod, where you're um, sort of coloring in this cross-section, this mitochondria in 30 nanometer increments. There are probably, I think, about 30, yeah, 30 slices here. That, that alone, just to do that one mitochondrion, could take a person a handful of minutes to do on all of those slices. Um, giving it some context to that same cell, this is the same orange cell like that was shown in that movie. There's hundreds of different mitochondria all colored differently in the cell here. So just to reconstruct and manually segment all of those mitochondria in that cell would take one person days to, to, to weeks. Um, so just, again, to, to use some simple analogies to drive home the, the, the point of why we need the, the tools that we'll be introducing throughout the rest of the session. Um, some back-of-the-envelope calculations of where I timed myself of how long it took me to trace these, these structures manually, and then extrapolating out to a whole data set. So this is the exact data set that I just showed, about one to two terabytes of image data. If, if you wanted to segment all of those mitochondria in that data set, of which there's tens to hundreds of thousands, would take three people working around the year. 24-7, 365 would take about one year for three people. Um, and of course, that's just one data set. So that doesn't really even get as a full experiment. It just gets one animal in one data set. We don't have any sort of 
experimental um, conditions. So if you wanted to segment multiple data sets, you just scale that. So two data sets would be six years, three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, the field's evolving towards wanting to image entire brain regions or, entire, or even entire, entire brains. So to, to image, um, to, to, if we had, say, an entire data set of an entire suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a relatively small brain center, it's only about 10 to 20,000 neurons. Um, and then we wanted to segment all the mitochondria out of that manually. It would take 250 people a whole year. And then just scaling forward to do a whole mouse brain would take millions. Um, to do a whole human brain would take almost the entire population of the world. Um, so, so obviously this is infeasible even currently with just one data set and extrapolating into the future it becomes just outlandish. Um, so there's, there's clearly a need for an automated solution, which is, is what we'll be introducing here. Um, obviously, uh, the, the, um, the answer to this is to get a machine to help us with it. Uh, unfortunately, image segmentation and a pattern recognition is, is a very difficult field if anyone has any experience. And it's, it's very hard to even detect very simple things uh, from images, let alone um, mitochondria that might only be, you know, a, a few uh, intensity values on a grayscale histogram different from, say, a, a nucleus or something like that. So this is still an incredibly difficult challenge, even though many people have been researching it for a long time. Uh, within the realm of automated segmentation techniques, there are, there are two, uh, I don't want to say competing, but complementary techniques that can be employed really depending on the type of data you have, uh, supervised and unsupervised. So supervised means that it requires some human interaction to nudge it in the right direction to the automated solution. Uh, this is what we'll be, we'll be presenting here, and this is what's typically used with EM data because it's so heterogeneous. Um, so by human interaction, what I mean is typically a human creates what's called training data. So instead of annotating the whole image, you'll annotate only, say, a, a really small box of maybe 500 by 500 pixels of it where you trace out all the mitochondria in there, and then that teaches the machine what that mitochondrion looks like texturally um, in grayscale values, things like that, so that it can then build a model to learn what that feature looks like and apply it to the whole data set. Uh, the advantage of this is that it's much faster than tracing the entire data set, obviously. So instead of taking three people working around the clock 24-7, 365, it might take one person a couple of hours to a day to generate this training data which can then be applied to, jet, to segment the, the whole data set. So we're, we're sort of abstracting away all of the work to a machine in a computationally intensive process, but it allows the human to then be doing other things with your time instead of um, uh, manually segmenting. On the other side of unsupervised segmentation, these are purely automatic methods, uh, the most basic of which I'll introduce in the next slide. Or the next slide, is thresholding. So this would be if you have a really dark structure that stands out from the rest of the data, you could set some sort of cutoff threshold where all the pixels above or below that are, are segmented out. Or you could set a, a, a sort of band pass where everything in between those two levels is segmented out or everything outside of that, etc. There are more um, advanced methods, watersheds, level sets, active contours, which I'll introduce. Um, some sort of clustering operations on pixel intensities. Uh, but again, those are typically used for cases in which we have really obvious features. Um, they generally are not very applicable to just raw EM images. Um, so as I said, thresholding. Uh, so on the left here, this is, again, a, a cropped image from that same data set I introduced you to. On the right here is a, is a histogram of pixel intensities of that image. So these are 8-bit images, so the, the uh, pixel intensities range from 0 to 255. Um, the point I want to sort of drive home here is how spread the histogram is. There's, there's no real, there might be some sort of peak here, but that doesn't really apply to anything. And it's hard to know that 
it's going to be applicable to the whole data set. So for thresholding, the sort of protocol would be to first filter the image. You want to apply some sort of blur or smoothing filter to, um, to get rid of the noise inherent in the image. We then, as I mentioned, would select some sort of upper and lower bounds on this histogram and then keep only the pixels belonging to the intensities between those two bounds. So here, as an example, uh, on this image, we've taken uh, just this band of intensities and then segmented them out to be red here. Um, this was, I believe, an attempt at segmenting mitochondria. <laughs> so if we go back and forth, this is a mitochondrion. So these, one, two, three, four. So you see, it, it got parts of them, but it didn't, A, it didn't get the whole thing. And B, it got a lot of other garbage out there. So um, those are what we'll refer to as false positives, and I'll introduce that more in the second session when I talk about how to quantitatively assess the accuracy of a segmentation. Um, suffice to say that this would quantitatively assess to be very poor. <laughs> um, so as I said, um, this type of an approach is really only useful for data where you have a, a really sort of maybe a bimodal histogram where we know one peak corresponds to exactly what we want or something where there's a really obvious darker light feature that stands out. So jumping into um, supervised learning approaches, which will be the uh, sort of focus of the entire rest of this day. Um, on the bottom left is a, a wireframe uh, bounding box of the data set with some points scattered throughout. Um, those points are typically selected by the user. And then what happens is that sent, um, a, a tile, in this case of 500 by 500 pixels, is extracted from the data set at the center of each of those points. So a user would typically go through and select, say, 50 points, 10 points, 20 points around the image that contain the feature of interest. So continuing with the mitochondria, say we wanted to select a region that has some mitochondria in it, as you see here. Um, then what the user does is performs just some simple manual segmentation on just that tile again. So instead of doing a full image, it's just this tile where all the mitochondria are colored in red, and that's done manually by a user to ensure accuracy. Then from that, we generate what are called training labels. Um, what's fed to the algorithm then is a set of images and labels. The images are just these, a set of say tw 10, 20, 50 of these raw grayscale EM images and then their corresponding labels, which is just a binary image stack uh, where all of the one-valued pixels correspond to um, pixels that belong to the feature that the user segmented, so in this case, mitochondria. Um, this set of training images and labels, or we'll call it a training set or training data, they're all kind of used analogously, is then used to train some sort of predictive model that can then be fed the entire data set. Um, there are a number of approaches for, for this, there are a number of different models we can train. The one that we have been using most extensively is called the Cascaded Hierarchical Model. Um, this was a, uh, a supervised segmentation framework developed by the University of Utah, uh, the references here for anyone interested. Um, this is a a long-standing collaboration we've had here with uh, the Scientific and Computing and Imaging Institute at Utah, particularly Tolga Tazdazin's group. Uh, this was developed by one of his grad students. Um, the novelty with this method is that it, it, it learns contextual information from the image, from the supplied images and labels across multiple scales. So not only is it learning image feature information at the native resolution, but then it also performs what's called downsampling. So if we start with a tile that's 500 by 500 pixels, downsampling takes it to 250 by 250 pixels by doing just a, an average a 2 by 2 average of pixel intensities and then 
projecting that to the downsampled image. So this gets us coarser and coarser image features as we go up the hierarchy. And um, this proves very useful, particularly for EM images, where, um, say, if you look really globally at a mitochondrion, you'd see sort of a, a membrane with some striations in the middle that belong to the Christie. And then if you look finer and finer, I mean, coarser and cur coarser resolutions, those features will sort of start to blur together. So, not, so it's learning what they look like at different scales. Um, training a model or a classifier, those are used interchangeably, and I'll probably continue to use them interchangeably throughout. Um, trains a classifier or a model at each step. And then um, from each of those uh, multi-resolution classifiers, trains one back at the native resolution. This is then uh, repeated a number of t iterations or stages. So this tr first train classifier is then fed back into the loop as the ground state and repeated to just keep nudging it in the right direction. Um, so for CHM, the number of iterations is referred to as the number of stages. And the number of levels is the number of times the image is downsampled. And we'll get into that once we start doing the demo and, and actually using it. Um, when deciding the number of stages and levels to do, uh, to use for training your model, it's typically very um, experimental. Uh, you typically always want to have at least two. Anything less than that just usually doesn't give you a very good model. Uh, as you increase them more than that, uh, there's usually some sort of diminishing returns. It might give you a better result, it might not, and that's where the experimentation comes in. Uh, we and you'll see this in the portal when you start running jobs in, in an hour or so. Uh, we typically start with two and two, two stages and two levels. And that's what I've always, typically always used as a starting point um, for my experiments. And then if that gives me a good result that I'm happy with, I move forward. If not, then we can increase one or the other and sort of experimentally determine which um, model is giving us the best results. So what does this process do once we've trained the model? which can take anywhere from a few minutes to, a f to maybe 24 hours, depending on how much training data we've fed it. Uh, we then supply the test images. In this case, it would be the whole volume of data. And then at the end of the process, what we get out are what are called probability maps. This is another term you'll hear repeated frequently throughout the day. This is just um, an image the same size as the test image that's been input, where every single pixel in that image is assigned a, a grayscale value that tells you how certain the um, algorithm is that that pixel belongs to your mitochondria. So you see the really white pixels here, the high uh, intensity value pixels um, are the regions that it's the, the, the algorithm is very certain that there's a mitochondria in there. You can see the correspondence with the yellow arrows here and how it corresponds to this image here. Um, so in this case, the, the, the model per performed pretty well. Um, you do see some sort of really kind of light-ish areas here, and those can become problems later. Um, uh, those are what you would call false positives. Uh, typically what we do after this, once you have these probabilities, the simplest thing to do to generate a segmentation which is just a binary image with ones and zeros, would be to, again, repeat that thresholding I showed you before, where we're only going to take the really white, high-intensity pixels and get rid of the rest. Sometimes that'll be good enough to get rid of these sort of darker areas. Sometimes it won't. And that's where a lot of the tools that I'll introduce um, in the second lecture after lunch will, will come in handy for sort of automatically filtering those out. Um, any questions on anything so far before I continue? OK. Um, so getting into a little bit of the um, implementation, how is this implemented? How do we get it to segment the full images? Um, what you see here is, again, a repetition of one slice from that data set I showed you, uh, which is 32,000 by 24,000 pixels. Now, if we fed this whole image and wanted to segment it all at once, um, it might be possible, but it would be very memory intensive and it would require a lot of time. It's not very parallelizable. 
Um, also, uh, you can consider a number of pre-processing steps that might help you to save time, one of which would be to use downsampling like I introduced before. So um, what we do almost ubiquitously for all data is downsample it to some degree where we still obtain a reasonable segmentation. So what you see here on the right is a curve uh, for different um, organelle targets where we trained a model using CHM and then assess the accuracy of that model. Again, I'll introduce that in the second um, lecture, how that's done. Um, suffice to say for now that this F value is, is a metric that's typically used as a, a sort of global metric for segmentation quality, ranging from zero to one, where one is 100% perfect correspondence to the actual truth and zero is just zero percent correspondence. Um, you can see that as we downsample, so downsampling has the effect of increasing the, the lateral pixel size, remember, because we're going from a big image to a small image. So you can think of this analogously as just increasing levels of downsampling as we go to the right on the curve. So you can see for certain features, typically the bigger ones like nuclei, which again are these really big obvious features here, we can downsample the image very significantly almost, so this is two times, four times, six times, eight times, ten times, and still get almost negligible change in segmentation quality. For some of the smaller features like mitochondria and lysosomes, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, as you down, because they're already small, so as you downsample, they become increasingly smaller or they become too few pixels for the, the sort of filters that are used to train the model to, to reliably detect, so the accuracy plummets. So using this sort of knowledge, we can devise our experiment in a, in a much more educated way. So we would never really feed, if we wanted to segment nuclei, as is demonstrated here, you would never feed it the, that full 32K by 24K image. You would downsample to some degree first. So here we have downsampled by 10X. Um, yeah, 10X. Close to 10X, I think. And or 8x, sorry, 8x. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't, that math doesn't make sense. 8x um, highlighted on the curve here, so you see we'll, we're still getting a very good accuracy of segmentation. But what this does is it decreases our computational time by many, many orders of magnitude. So what's going on behind the scenes uh, when you feed, and this will be done through the portal in the demo session, so what, what we'll do after this once I introduce you to how to use iMod to do the manual segmentation is you'll use our uh, CHM web portal to feed it data that you've created, train a model, and then perform segmentation on some raw images. What's going on behind the, the scenes, behind the hood, when you feed it that raw image is instead of doing the classification on that full image, even at 4K by 3K, it's going to break it down into small tiles. So in this case, our training data set was 500 by 500 pixels, so it'll break it down into a set of 500 by 500 pixel tiles. As I mentioned, this has the effect of um, decreasing the computational load per image, and it enables much more parallelization. So each of these tiles, or a, a small set of these tiles, can be sent to different processors, different nodes on a supercomputing cluster to get as the result much faster. So something that might take, um, say, six to seven CPU years for a full data set the size of, of, of this one, that's one to two terabytes of image data, we can get that back in about six to seven days of real world time using this sort of tiling and parallelization scheme. So that's what's going on under the hood in the portal when you, um, when you submit your job. So of course, uh, what's done after that entire full image on the left is um, uh, classified by the model is that each of those tiles are then stitched back together to yield the output probability map, as you see here, um, all stitched together. That can then be analyzed uh, to get the segmentations, which you see here. So all that was done there between those two steps was just a, a simple pixel intensity threshold was set so that all of the 
uh, pixels that map to the really high intensity, the high probability predictions are kept. So you can see some of the, the halos I was referring to there earlier, the sort of intermediate grayscale ranges where it's not 100% certain what it is will disappear when you do that. And again, in the second lecture and demo session, I'll introduce some more advanced methods of, of getting rid of some of those false positives. Um, of course, this is just a demo for uh, a, a, a case in which we, we can't dance downsample as much. So for mitochondria, we see a pretty precipitous fall off as we keep downsampling. So we want to perform that segmentation without dance, downsampling too much. So this is done at 2x downsampling. So going from 32K by 24K to 16K by 12K. Um, obviously, the, the, the point of this graphic is just to show that the, the challenge is, is magnified many times when, when you can't downsample as much. So this sort of map of the stars looking image now is the probability map for mitochondria. Um, segmented again using some sort of uh, a filter that will be introduced again in this, the second lecture. Uh, you can see what we did here going again from probabilities to segmentation was first setting again a threshold value to get rid of the low probability pixels and then using some sort of shape information. So these sort of crescent half moon shaped crescent moon shaped things here are blood vessels that are detected erroneously by the model as false positives. Um, However, they're obviously way too big. There's, there's no mitochondria in, in this data set that's going to be that big. So we can also set things like size exclusion filters in addition to just pixel intensity values to get rid of those um, to yield the final segmentation you see here. And this is just an inset shown here in this box uh, illustrating the accuracy for that region. Um, so again, this was all done automatically. This is analogous to what would take one person a few minutes to do. Uh, that was done all automatically by just training a model and then running through our steps that we've developed and we'll be teaching you. Um, so that's it for the, the, the kind of crash course onto what the data look like and the basic um, protocol for generating the, manual, the automatic, manual and automatic segmentations. Uh, what I'm going to do for the next yeah, good. I have about half an hour. For the next half hour is introduce you to the software iMod that will be used to manually segment the data and make the training data in your demo. Um, has anyone installed it yet? Okay. Everyone has Macs, so this should be pretty easy. <laughs> okay. Um, before I get into that, before I shift gears and introduce the software, does anyone have any questions about the basic information I discussed. I know I, 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 a lot of it was kind of high level because I had to get through a lot pretty quickly. Um, if there's no questions, you can always grab me later throughout the day. Um, I'm sure there'll be some that come up. Okay. <laughs>